our third point um, is about dollars top dog status. So you very uh, aptly set me up. So contention. Let's talk about the contention in the press. So the contention in the press is that um, the dollar faces imminent, imminent death because trade is shifting to other currencies. Now, we've had some excellent analysis, both by Ian Bremer and by Jim O'Neill, who came up with the term BRICS, which literally is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, basically the term for um, emerging economies. And uh, the headlines have, uh, I'll read some of them out. There have been, they've been very interesting. The headlines have been, Russia is embracing the Chinese Yuan for much of its global trade. Not just, by the way, for its um, China-Russia uh, trade, but also its global trade. Saudi Arabia is turning to Petro Yuan um, because, of course, China is the biggest importer of Saudi oil. We know that um, now there's been a headline that Brazil and China have agreed to ditch the dollar for uh, bilateral trade. The most spectacular headline, of course, was BRICS countries are planning to, deserve, uh, planning to develop a new reserve currency. Um, and of course, India, which um, has not been a big economy, although it is growing fast, even India is going to settle some trade in rupees. So is the status of the dollar um, as top dog over? What do you say, Glenn? To me, this is an old story that uh, recurs, uh, an old chestnut in, you know, dressed up different ways, uh, depending on the the issue in the year. <clears throat> Early in my career, well, yeah, in the mid 80s or in the 1980s, uh, everyone was scrambling to learn the Japanese model of, uh, of business and the Japanese model of uh, managing finance, because uh, the new superpower was going to be Japan, and they were so much better than than the old, um, now fatigued uh, American uh, methods, and so on. And that lasted for a decade, and now we've had forty years of of Japan struggling uh, for various reasons. A separate story. <clears throat> uh, it, it's similar to um, people as they get older, regardless of generation that we're talking about. Uh, or time period, uh, looking to the halcyon days when things were better before. And uh, Dad Gummit, you know, when I was a boy, I walked uh, through snowstorms in July, uphill going and uphill coming home, uh, and we were just tougher. And and things are better, and you guys are all soft and decadent and falling apart. All of that is baloney uh, and, and is nonsense. <clears throat> the truth, uh, to the the kernel of truth, or more than kernel, uh, to the story about the decline of the dollar is what we talked about before uh, today and, and many other times, that the U.S. is not the hegemon that it was from 1945, which was in human historic terms, not just contemporary historic terms, but from the dawn of civilization today is a unique moment that no right. other civilization or, or generation of human beings has ever lived. That's not the case. Oh, it was it was an it was an aberration because yes. uh, Bomber Harris and company bombed Germany flat, and so German industrial might was gone. And of course, the two nuclear strikes on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, along with the bombing of Japanese cities, meant that J Japanese industrial might was gone. France had been occupied by Nazi Germany, so France, in any case, was out of the picture, couldn't s step into a leadership role. Britain was broken by its Pyrrhic victory in World War II, and Britain had rationing at the end of World War II and was losing its empire. So Tell the only... Is. Yeah, and so the only 800-pound uh, gorilla left standing was America, which didn't suffer war right. on its soil. Yes, there was Pearl Harbor, but that was minor compared to what Europe and Asia went through. Yeah, mo most countries did not return. The GNP of most countries who were uh, the the main protagonists of World War II, which were the, the most of the great power, all the great powers, um, their GNPs did not return to 1913 levels until the mid-1950s. Uh, yes. So they lost 40 years of uh, development, during which time the U.S. had already been 
the, economically the greatest power by 1895, um, even possibly earlier, 1890 maybe. Um, and so for 100, for 75 years, the U.S. was had no had no peer running on the in the track because they had all been knocked down. But okay, so it's it's to me a, a um, almost a reflexive reaction to to look for the decline of whatever is the greater power and to find that things were better before and they aren't as good anymore. I I, have, I don't find it. I, not only do I find it not convincing, I, I find it. Um, not rigorous thinking. When you look at the, um, uh, you can cite statistics uh, ad nauseum, uh, really, but just to take a few, the statistics show that, yes, China, obviously China is now a global power and will become more and more powerful and influential every day for as far as we can see into the future, barring a catastrophe that I don't see happening in, in China or one hopes through a conflict between China, basically China and the United States. <clears throat> but in global trade, as we just said, is greater now than it has been since uh, for several generations and continues to be so that India and Rwanda and every other country have opportunities to play off the, each power, as I said before. Those, those are facts. But the deeper facts about the dollar remaining as the central currency, which really speaks about the um, strength and dynamism of the American economy, um, are unchanged. The uh, global share of gross national product of the United States in 1990 was 25%. In 2023, it's 25%. The uh, global share of the United States, the, the United States share of the G7, the seven most powerful economies in the world, except in China. Um, in 1990, the U.S. accounted for 40% of the G7's GNP. In 2023, the United States accounts has accounted for 58% of the GNP. This is unlikely to change the power of inertia and convenience of the status quo with regard to the currency of exchange, main currency of exchange, which is the dollar, um, in addition to those fundamental facts of power, economic strength, uh, itself is a power. It's hard to change. Even as the, the, uh, the rupee increases in power as, as India's economy becomes more significant in global terms, even as the yuan does for China. Uh, they, these are nibbling at the edges and will continue to do so for many years in the future. Now, the U.S. can screw up. Uh, the U.S. does screw up, is screwing up, uh, and things can change. Uh, there is no stasis. Um, and as we've seen with the last 15 years with regard to China and, and the U.S.'s stumbles. But for, the, for now and for as far as we can see into the future, that won't change. And why? And, and I'll conclude in this one thing. What, what gives the U.S. the advantage, aside from the fact that we were not bombed to oblivion 75 years ago, which was an important element in, in this? But it really is, and, and, I, and I'll tell one little anecdote. When I was in the National Intelligence Council, a number of congressmen approached us uh, and said, we want you to, to identify the five critical technologies that uh, guarantee, that provide for American uh, supremacy and will guarantee it in the future so that we can protect them. And so that was our assignment. So we looked at it and our answer, uh, we said, you've asked the wrong question. You framed the issue in the wrong way. And uh, to answer it would lead us to uh, decline. What, because technology changes too rapidly, there are no five. Uh, even if there are, uh, they won't be those the same literally six months from now. So that's not the question. What guarantees American, has provided American supremacy and will guarantee it in the future, possibly, or at least give it a possibility of, of uh, continuing, is this web of research and development uh, centers of angel investors, of venture capital, of private equity, of public markets, of the rule of law, 
the facility of, of labor law that makes it possible to start a business without taking years before you're allowed to do so and having to pay kickbacks and grafts in order to do so that are like leeches on the uh, strength of the of the corporate uh, body uh, of research laboratories a, a nexus of Harvard and MIT not far from my, from where I am and the other 48 universities in the greater metropolitan Boston area in addition to Silicon Valley in addition to the University of Chicago hundreds of them, the, the premier institutions for funding research and talent and work uh, in the world that draw, when I was working, which is now 15 years ago, 500,000 graduate students from China a year. The Republican people who asked the question said, well, they're stealing our, they're, they're going home and they're, they're going to compete against us. That is true. But it was true for 100,000 of the 500,000. The other 400,000 stayed in the United States and founded things like Google and Amazon and who knows what else. So that's. And Google and Amazon were not founded by the Chinese. Sorry. Glenn, Google and uh, Amazon were not founded by the Chinese. Google was founded by the Russians. Oh. One of the founders was Russian. No, no, no. I, okay, I'm, I'm lumping all foreigners together. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's outrageously, outrageously. Yeah. Um, but, but the point of the United States benefiting from the brilliance of foreign yeah. uh, seekers that are coming to the United States is it remains true. Um, underpinning these things are have been the rule of law and freedom of speech and immigration I touched upon more than indirectly. Yeah. This is unparalleled in the world. And that's why the dollar is uh, ultimately why the dollar remains the currency of exchange is the currency of exchange and is likely for the foreseeable future to remain it. I'm not at all a pessimist on this point. All right, two things here. One is um, dollar as uh, a currency of exchange, basically a currency in which trade is denominated, and uh, that is including when the U.S. is not is not involved in that trade. So it is used for funding, for pricing, for trade invoicing, for settlement, cross-border borrowing and lending. The other is dollar as a reserve currency of the world, wherein people peg their currencies to the dollar, wherein people, or rather not just people, companies, central banks keep foreign exchange reserves in the dollar. And reserve currencies usually have momentum. The pound had momentum long after Britain declined. In fact, by the late 19th century, Britain was not the leading industrial power in the world. That honor went to America and to Germany. And even Japan really became a great industrial power by the 1930s and really sped up. And, uh, and there were other challenges, challenges on the horizon too. But still, the pound continued long after the decline of Britain's industrial might. And so there's a momentum. And so when it comes to the reserve currency, uh, there have been misgivings, and those misgivings are amplifying because of geopolitical reasons, because, as Peter Isaacson points out, because of sanctions. Um, the Chinese and the Japanese are buying less German debt, um, sorry, less American debt. Uh, we have a German economist called Alexander Gloy, who has uh, done a whole um, uh, series on, on this point, or rather one big article, but he's touched upon it in other um, other um, articles. Um, having said that, uh, the big uh, challenge to the challenge to the dollar is that uh, the challenges uh, are um, amorphous and they are pulling in different directions. So let's look at the BRICS. Brazil, for instance, is in a dire economic and political crisis. It's a deeply divided country. It's fundamentally a seller of commodities and no one wants to hold Brazilian currency including Brazilians themselves. Uh, Russia is at the moment going through a rather grim war. And yes, its economy only declined by 2%. Maybe they're lying about their statistics. Uh, but Russia is unlikely to be uh, the power that anyone is looking forward to trade. Their, their demography has been declining. Uh, they are fundamentally a big uh, gas station. You know, oil and gas is what they what they sell. Uh, um, then we get to India. 
Well, India is certainly a growing economy, but India has its major problems. India faces uh, the risk of remaining in the middle income trap. Um, India also has seen the rupee um, over the last 10 years go from 53.6 uh, or so to the dollar to 83.01 or more than 83 to the dollar. So the rupee has, has fallen in relation to the dollar and uh, holding rupee means that you're incurring a massive exchange rate risk. Um, China, of course, is, is the dominant player, but China has too many uh, exchange rate controls and China also has a massive uh, bad debts crisis and its currency is not entirely convertible. So yes, you could trade in that currency, but holding it is too risky. South Africa, well, South Africa All is going through a major crisis. That concern is, is the name Jack Ma. Um, exactly. Exactly, exactly. And South Africa um, basically is again going through a Brazil-like crisis. So there is at the moment no alternative and the talk of BRICS to create a new currency is still talk because um, of a very simple reason. They're all pulling in different directions. Their own domestic institutions are not mature enough. And as of yet, there is uh, no challenger. Having said that, America has has spectacularly undermined its institutions. America is playing political football with its debt ceiling. And uh, America, uh, at some point, is not going to be able to carry on the way it is carrying on. So uh, we could come to a situation wherein uh, people might flee to another store of value, whether that's gold, whether that's cryptocurrencies. Uh, whether, and crypto, in my view, won't work. But what may happen is we may, leave, we may live in a more fragmented world yes. in which the dollar may no longer be king. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember what, what a friend of ours always says, things last until they don't. And things are far more fragile than they seem. Uh, and of course, I come from, from the old world, so I say so. So, yeah, yes, the dollar is just, king uh, and will remain king in our... Yeah. Uh, oops. So I was saying the dollar is king and will remain king in the foreseeable foresight, but there's an, yeah. it's not guaranteed its top uh, dog position forever. Yeah, I, I, my, my, the last thing I'll say is that you know, Americans have always liked to compare the, the American Republic to ancient Rome. And Western history, of course, the reference point for everything really is ancient Rome and Greece. <clears throat> and Rome, and the great question is what why did Rome fall? And uh, Rome didn't fall because of the Huns. Uh, really, it, it fell because Rome became no longer what Rome was, and, and the uh, enemy was from within, and it undermined itself over 200 years. Um, but uh, similarly, uh, debt lunacy and uh, uh, trying to, to uh, overthrow uh, democracy for a strong man and various other steps uh, can do America in. All right. On that note, uh, we've come to the end of our episode for April. We will see you in May. And until then, it's bye from me and uh, all the best with everything. Join the conversation at Fair Observer and subscribe to our YouTube channel.